So I was saying that I wanted to remind you a bit about the, the, the schedule. Um, so basically we are on the midpoint of the course. So today's lecture is going to be uh, probably the last lecture on like C++ core language. So there is nothing, there's no such thing. So that's the name I came up with. Uh, the idea of these names is to split up the, the course in two parts. And actually I was trying, I was postponing all the object oriented programming techniques and classes and so on for the second part uh, because of many reasons. One of the reasons is to try to convince you uh, that uh, C++ is much more than C with classes. Uh, because if I start C++ just talking about classes, then probably uh, you, you might have this feeling. So for now, we, we have seen a lot of tools, a lot of functionality. Today, we're, we're going to see the last part, I care that you learn. And there is no object-oriented programming involved so far. So the idea of this is that you you get to know the the core basics of the language that are not related with classes itself. And starting from this lesson and so on, we're probably, probably going to uh, to move a bit faster. So as another reminder, so on previous editions of this particular course, uh, the, the, the whole lectures ender, ended by 29th of May. So if you want to compare again like other editions, so you should be comparing against the fact that uh, all these lessons were end up we're ending in uh, the fourth week of the, the semester. So I'm trying to speed up the, the concepts so you also have more time to learn, to learn chunk by chunk. So as a reminder, uh, also, so if you haven't, it's a really good idea to catch up with your homeworks. So homework four is already out. And during this week, I will release homework number five. And also homework number five as homework number three is related to the final project. So the best you can do on this homework is it's going to be better for you because uh, if you remember, you only have like four weeks. So this is one month for the final project. And it's going, I mean, it's going to be painful if you wait for the last minute to do it. So the idea is that you go, you start doing steps for your project during the semester, right? Okay, so today's lecture is going to be a half of the lecture about like some more functionality of C++ itself, but I'm not, not going to go really deep. And then we will see an interaction on classes, and then you have uh, some homework to do after this lesson. Okay, let's get started. So utilities. So this is something that usually not all developers of C++ are super aware of. So the C++ standard comes with an utility libraries that includes a variety of, of libraries that provide functionality ranging from bit counting to partial function application. So this means you can do a lot of stuff. And these libraries can be broadly divided into two groups. So the language support library and the general purpose library. So the language support library is basically some, it's, so the set of libraries that interact closely with the language. So this will provide classes and functions that interact closely with all the features of the language, like the types. For example, there is a type support library. As an example, there is size T. There's also a dynamic memory management library. And we will discuss about this on, on when we see memory management. But share pointer, unique pointer is all part of this dynamic memory management library. There's also error handling. Uh, there's initializer list. So for example, whenever you do vector and then you do curly braces, you're basically using this uh, functionality from the library and much more, right? There's also some general purpose utilities. And this means basically that these are utilities that will uh, add a layer of functionality on top of the, the language. So it's not uh, intrinsically related to the language. A board might be one example. So for example, date and time is a great uh, example of utility libraries. So uh, the timing is not part of the language, but there is libraries for doing this. So you need to go and search for third part libraries. Uh, there is also starting from C++ 17, optional, variant, and any. We will see some examples of these utilities. 
and there's also Persian tuples. So we have seen tuples a lot because I think they're great and also they provide similar functionality as Python related um, code. So if you go to previous lecture and then you search through tuple, you, you, you will see some examples of this particular utility. And there is also one example on homework number three, I guess, on how to use this tuple. There's also swap, forward and move. So whenever we see move semantics, this is probably in two or three lectures, uh, we will be using these utilities. Also hash, so we discussed about hash on previous lecture. It's also part of this library. And then there will be a formatting library that is basically FMT, uh, but this is coming in the next release of the, the standard. So basically there are a lot of tools uh, you might want to use um, that already come with the language. So if you have already a compiler installed that supports C++ 17, for example, then you have all these utilities uh, for free. So swap is the easiest example. So basically you have two variables, A and B. You can swap these variables. So no need to write a swap function. So if you ever want to do swap, just go and use this. Usually to use these utilities, you need to include the utility library. So include utility and that's all. So there is new uh, crazy examples. So uh, we will just discuss briefly uh, how to work with these utilities. And also my recommendation is whenever you feel like you have the need to, to do some utility or use some utility. So go and check it up on CPP reference on the library. Maybe there is already something for you there. So on this case, this is variant. So this is new on C++ 17. And then basically a variant is, is something that can be anything like between integer and float. So I create an object of this variant and then B, B1 actually can be an integer or a float, but not the both. And then for example, whenever I do this, so basically I'm assigning an integer value to this variant. So basically I'm saying this variant is going to be of integer type. And in order to access this element, then I will be using another utility function that, that is called stdget. And then I will ask for the integer part of the variant. And then I can access this element. Of course, if I want to access the float part of this variant, I will get an error. But there is an easy way to catch this error. So there is also examples on the CPP reference. And then for, for example, I have another variant that is going to be of type float. And in this case, I will initialize this variable with this number. And then I can also get the, the floating part of the of the variant using the, this syntax one, because basically uh, the zero part is the integer part and the one part is a float. I can also put float there. Um, and there is also, so these three examples, these three lines here has the same meaning. So let's use this. So basically this all is the same. So I can do B2 and then copy the, the integer value of B1 or the zero value or just B1 because it's now we are talking about an integer and I can also access the integer like of B2 like this. And then if you try to run this example, this is the output of the program. So that's basically variant. It will depend up to you like where and how you should use it. But just a, it's just an example of uh, what are the utilities of the C++ language. So usually maybe you want to create a new type and then uh, inside this type you want to have an integer and a float and then you will have some boolean variables to, to use any of these types but maybe using just a variant is a better example. So this is something that Python programmers will like. So whenever you get used to the type safety of C++ uh, like me, you have really hard times trying to use Python because you never know the types. And that basically any is basically any type. So in this case, there will be some syntax involved as usual. So it's never as simple as the Python syntax. But if you have an any type, it can be any type. And in this case, whenever you do one, you will have an integer inside this type. Of course, you cannot do, for example, C out and then A, because A itself is just a, a class of type any. So it's an object of the any class. So you need to cast it to integer. And that's why there is this function called any cast. So the syntax is not super good, but at least there is something. 
then you can put a double without doing any further step and then you can access this double with the same cast function and then you can use boolean or any type you want so basically any can hold uh, an object of any type that's why the name right option option is something also cool so this is usually something we we can solve using like if and else but optional it's an optional value right so on this particular case we have a string factory function this is the function i'm talking about and then depending on on an input parameter like it's create i can return a string or nothing so basically the idea of this is to return an empty object if there is for example if if the create um, variable is, is false uh, and this saves me one if and else uh, statement. For example, if I want to create this uh, more in C++ is awesome, I just call the, this function and then I just say true. And then how to how I access the value of the optional value is just calling value. And also for example, so this is a trivial example, but you can work like uh, better examples. Uh, I can also do something like this, like value or, this basically means Give me the value of the optional, but in case the optional uh, hasn't been created, so I will put this value. So basically, this means if the string is empty, then the string value will be uh, a sad face that is down here. So this is like some utilities you might want to use while writing your program. Again, this will help you to express the intent of your code much better than if you just fill your program with if and else, if and else, if and else. So make sure you 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 at least uh, take into account the utilities of the language while you write programs. Tuple is a really widely used uh, utility. Again, we have seen these uh, examples uh, on previous lecture, uh, but I really like Tuple, sort of say. Uh, one big chunk of advice is that with tuples, the the types are going to be really verbose so in this case you will have a tuple that is basically a tuple of a double a car a char and a string and then you can also use a new type and just call it student and then okay this is a student this way you can create objects of this tuple uh, much with a much better syntax like in this case we are saying i will create a student and then this student has this uh, gpa this gray and this is the name for example, and again also uh, make tuples on the fly with make tuple. And here I can use structured binding to get the GPA grade and name of this particular tuple. As usual, the recommendation is that you write this co uh, code down on your computer and then you try it and then make sure you try to understand all the steps uh, involved. Chrono is another utility. So in this case, there are much better ways of doing benchmarking, but let's say that you want to benchmark a particular function. So you have this Fibonacci function, and then here you will have the start and the end of the function. And here is the function call, for example, Fibonacci, and the integral is 42. And then you can actually print how much time elapsed between uh, these two steps. So this is a really naive way of doing benchmarking, but if you want to know how much time you spend on a function, this is a good way of doing it. Again, this is all part of the utility libraries. So ideally, you will go to this link and first like try to, I mean, it's not a book, so it's not something you can read, uh, but uh, you can check like, what do you have in there for you? And as a, as, so I have like bad news in terms of utilities. So we are using the C++ 17 standard, uh, but if it happens that you go and work for a company in let's say one year, it's very unlikely that uh, the company is using modern compilers. So there are many reasons of why this happens. One is that uh, it's really slow for companies to do migration. So, it's, uh, so if you have like products that are working worldwide, you cannot just change the compiler like every for every release that is like every one or two months. Uh, so as a so as a alert and a warning, I want to warn you that 
in our courses we have the freedom to choose the standard but may so keep in mind that if you enter the industry like in one year it's very unlikely that you will have all these utilities at your hand unless on the company you work they are using modern compilers but most of the utilities like the good ones came with c plus plus 14 and 17 so if you're using like something like c plus plus 11 that is already a 10 years old uh, standard then you will probably uh, not have much of uh, of this so i will skip this part now so we can uh, basically get to the meaty part of the lecture but basically here you can see how to do error handling uh, using c++ so i'm sorry we need to skip this but basically the intuition behind error handling using try catch blocks is that you only use this for exceptional behavior so i saw a bunch of submissions for homework number two that were using try catch so it's not really wrong but actually an exception is something that it's an exceptional behavior so if for example a wrong parameter should not lead to an exception uh, make sure you go and check it out this part of the lecture there's also uh, i can also give you the link for igor's explanation on this in case you you want it but basically so it's often misused because people tend to do try catch everywhere and of course this makes your code impossible to read and then it's not the the idea of this try catch for error handling so only use try catch if you really need to handle an exceptional behavior so if the input parameter is not correct then you can print an error message of whatever there is that's not exceptional so it's something that might happen so ideally you should never use exceptions unless you're writing libraries or doing like some uh yeah some really robust library so in our course it's really unlikely that you need exceptions but if you want to use it go ahead so i don't complain but google people just say okay don't use it it's going to be a mess then the last part of this uh, half of the lesson will be like about the input output library as usual cpp reference has all the information for this and then we're going to see how to work with files but why i am putting this here it's because it's the, la the last part of the core language without talking about classes and memory management and also because you need to use it for your homework so how we read and write files so we have been doing this for the c out c error and c in so basically the syntax will be exactly the same with the angular uh, brackets uh, but the difference is instead of redirecting streams to the standard output that is basically a file in Linux, but never mind, we, we can do this uh, right into files. So if you take as an example the homeborn m3, then what we're doing, we are trying to create an image browser using HTML language, and we are throwing all the information to the standard output and then redirecting to a file. Of course, this is a really bad idea, and it's really prone to errors it's very likely that this might fail in the future or now do it like this because that's the homework using the standard output because by the time of homework number three we haven't seen this uh, read and write of files but of course ideally you will want to write the output of your functions to a file that is called index.html not to the standard output and then redirect into this file so basically you have like uh, a whole library that is you you get it by including this fstream library on the standard template library and there, there's also some modes we will see but there are like three examples here so in this case is file in so we will uh, read a, a, a file so this will create an input file stream and also the counterpart is the output file so with this file stream we can output uh, streams to the file and of course there is an input output file that is rarely used but you can also do it uh, like this using fstream so basically if you want to read a file then you will use input file stream and if you want to uh, write to a file then you will use uh, a standard output file stream so how will you do this oh sorry so these are like the modes you can open so when when you create these objects so 
in this case for example you're creating an object of so you're creating an output file stream and then you need to use some parameters the first one will be the file name of course and then the mode and then the mode can be any of these or any combination so you can do append you can do binary mode you can do in out so there are many modes of where you of how you can deal with files as a really more example so let's say you are working with ascii files then it's really easy to use these output file streams actually using the same syntax as string streams so remember lecture one or two i think two when you have structured uh, formatted data you can use this string streams uh, syntax really easily so you can say from this stream like put it on an integer so in this case we have uh, let's use this color so we have an integer and then a floating value and then a string and then another floating point value so with this particular uh, structured format it's really easy to use file streams because the syntax is quite uh, nice let's say the only problem is that the same way of string streams it will fail if you have so if the format is not correct so keep in mind that if your file is have some errors then you will need to deal with this error or use another approach like we will see now so this is the example we were talking about so again you can create this file and try it at home but basically the syntax is quite easy so the first thing you will do is you will create this standard input file stream then you need to provide the the file name you want to read and then the the mode in this case you only want to read so you will use the ios base in and then how you read data you basically output this input file stream and then to the structured uh, data form so we have i a s and b not the best names but it doesn't fit on the slide so i is basically an integer the a is a double and then s is a string and then the b again is an hour double so if you so this is the file we're talking about so probably having the file there would be better but again so we have uh, one integer floating point string and floating point oops and then here we have the same so this way you can read files really really easily and the syntax is like going so passing the, the string through all these variables if you have any error then this uh, while loop will fail otherwise it will read until we will read all these lines until it reaches the end of the file so this is a way you can use to to read files but let's say that you you don't have the the format or is not really structured like you don't always have the same uh, lines so you will do it like using the get line function so this is for example another uh, file you want to read and this is a source code on how to read this file so basically you will get this line and populate a string uh, ideally you can try this example at home how we write uh, text files using this output file stream is basically the same syntax as um, as the input file stream but uh, using the other mode and the other object that is the of stream so here we create an, a file stream and this is the file name it's going to be out txt and in this case by default we don't specify the mode that is going to be basically to uh, to write in this case we want to just write one uh, double the only problem with this is that we are writing an ascii uh, value so this will be a string so we need to specify the precision of this double and of course we will lose some precision if we want to write floating point values to string format that is basically this ascii again if you pay attention the syntax is exactly the same as c out so in this case the the um, the out the output file stream is acting as the c out and this is what you will do if you were doing this image browser exercise but in a good way but remember just use the standard output for the homework and then lastly about reading and writing uh, files so uh, we have seen 
quickly two examples how to read a text file and how to write text file or ASCII format but there is also a, a better way of doing this that is called serialization where basically uh, we will try to put all the binary information from our data into a file and this is also called binary file and there are many ways uh, many reasons why you want to do this so instead of writing like ascii data like for example one dot five six whatever we will write the sequence of bytes that represent this data so the document must have a structure because uh, if you open the document you will see zeros and one so basically you will see binary information so it's nothing you can read so you really know to know you really need to know uh, the structure of your document Naturally, the writing and reading of this type of files will be really fast because that's basically so you need to convert to an, any intermediate intermediate uh, uh, representation. So if you, if you have like one byte that is eight bits <clears throat> and you want to write it to the file, you just need to put those eight bits in the file and you need to represent this particular byte with a character or whatever. There will be no precision loss for floating points because we are going to put for a floating points for example the four bytes that represent the floating point will be directly written to the file so there is no conversion to one dot whatever uh, and then it will be actually quite smaller than just ASCII file and why is this because the binary data is much uh, lightweight so it's basically zeros and one and if we want to represent a double with a string then we need for example for a precision of 20 we, we will need uh, 21 characters so 21 character is 20 times 8 so it's a lot of bytes for representing just one double so they will be uh, much smaller the syntax is going to be a bit ugly but we will discuss it a bit right now so let's say i, I have for example uh, an image right like uh, an image for, that has like really small one we have two rows and two columns and then basically the this back will represent that like the data and in this case it's going to be full of zeros because there is it's basically a dummy image so how i do this how i write this image into a binary format then the first thing again is to open an output file stream and then i will pick the name in this case will be image.dat be image.bin it's up to you it's the name is not relevant and then i will pick two modes so the first mode is going to be out so i want to write this file and also i want to do it in a binary form and then instead of using the o stream operators uh, as we saw with the structured data and ascii format like with the angular brackets we need to use this uh, sort of ugly syntax uh, so there is no remedy for this but basically we want so let's say the first thing we want to do is to write the rows and the columns uh, and this is part of the structure of the document so the first this amount of data will be a row and then it's basically an integer and then it will be a column and all this uh, binary digit will be all stick together on the file and of course I we will run the example and we can we cannot see the, the data so how we do this we will call this member function of the output file stream that is called write and then we will use this ugly syntax that you will most likely understand in two or three weeks but basically this reinterpreter cast will get the information of the integer value and will basically return the bits so if you have it's like open a debugger and you have like an integer value that is four so if you inspect the memory you will have actually uh, four bytes that is four yeah it's four bytes for integer that is basically 32 bits of information so this basically is converting from an integer format to a binary format and then we need to specify the size of this particular element so we know okay i will start writing so it, you need to specify where is the element and then where this ends so i can get this amount of digits basically zeros and one and put it into the file and then the same holds true for the vector the only difference is that uh, it's a vector so the data is a bit longer 
So first we will specify the first element because this is where the vector will start and then we need to write all the binary digits for that represents this particular vector and for doing this we will use the size of the vector and then the size of float. Why float? Because the vector is holding floating point values. So a floating point value will have uh, four bytes and then the size of the whole vector will be the amount of uh, members you have. In this case two times three is six as far as I know. And then six times um, four bytes is going to give you the, the size of the chunk you want to write. So one thing I want to show you really, really quickly. So this, this thing. Yes, yeah, so for example, if we out demo bin, so this is basically the example we are seeing on the slides. So do time constraint, let's compile it and then run it. So if we, so we out demo bin. So if I run this example, then I will create this image.date. That is basically the, the binary form and the first thing you can do is like try to inspect the file actually let's do one thing let's remove this image so you know it is not there and then we run the program and then the image is there so if you want to inspect this file this is what you get so it's all binary data so it's the same if you want to inspect the binary executable so it makes no sense it's basically chunk you cannot get sense of the binary form but something important is that this file is 32 uh, bytes so this is the amount of files of the um, of the file and it's 32 because if we cut so it's going to be four bytes plus four bytes so we have eight and then six so this is six times four it's going to be 24 so 24 plus eight is going to be 32 bytes so the binary form will store exactly the amount of data you have in memory and if you want to try this let me see out demo uh, uh, out sample okay i forgot to do the but if you do this with characters then of course you know it's not going to be 32 bytes it's going to be much larger so how to read from binary files the syntax is ugly and it's actually the same. You do, I mean, you will provide uh, an address to the variable you want to populate with the binary data. This is an example. My recommendation is you try both examples uh, at home and actually you try to do both. So you try to do write this image, dummy image on a text form, so an ASCII using the, the Angular bracket syntax on the stream operators and also you do it in binary form and then you compare the sizes and blah 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 so that's actually a really good exercise so it's actually super easy to work with this but the thing is syntax it's a bit ugly so that's the only drawback so the pros of using binary files is that they are faster than ASCII format both reading and writing the size is drastically smaller so as you saw if you have 32 bytes then the binary representation on a file is 32 bytes and nothing more so unless you do some sort of compression you cannot go uh, lower than this value another pro is that there are many libraries to facilitate serialization so boost serialization is a really good library and it's widely used everywhere so you don't actually really need to write all these um, small um, functions codes uh, by hand. You can use a, a library on top and make it much easier. And some cons is that the syntax is a bit ugly, but this is basically true for most of C++ code. Then the file is not readable by human. So this means that if you are debugging, for example, and then you want to inspect what you have written to the file, then you cannot make sense because it's just binary then also you need to know the format before reading so let's say you write this image to a binary file and then you want to read it you, you need to know exactly the format so first you need to, to read an integer then another integer and then the vector 
you cannot do like the other way around because you will read data but it's going to be junk because it's going to be so the file has no structure it's like a stream of one and zeros so you the reader need to exactly know uh, how is the structure of this file and then the last but not least another con is you need to use this for your homework so homework number five will be all about uh, writing and reading to binary files so basically you will be computing SIF descriptors and then you will save this uh, descriptor as binary format and this is used for your final project and then lastly the file system library again this is something that uh, it came with C++ 17 so if you are if you are working for a company it's very unlikely that you are you will be able to use this but there are another workarounds for using this so the ideas of this library is that now that you know how to read and write to files you also might want to perform operations on paths on regular files and directories so for example you want to create a directory ask if certain file is created or not and if there is no file there then you can create your binary file for example so it's a like a utility library on top of the input output library to help you to work with files in your system so it's inspired basically in Boost file system, as many of the standard libraries were incubated in Boost, make your life much easier. And again, all information is on CPP reference. We will see some examples on how this is important. So forget for a moment that you like how to create or read files. And in this case, we want to basically use the language as a shell. So on this particular example, I want to print all the files that are in a particular directory. So the first thing I will do with this example is to create a directory. So this basically is the same as doing make the dash p sandbox slash a and b. And then I will create two file streams. So basically two files. One is called file one txt and two will be basically empty, it's just a dummy file. And then I will use this directory iterator. So this is really cool because you actually can iterate through the directory. And then you can do with this syntax. So this will be a path and then call the directory iterator, iterator for this sandbox directory. And then you just print all the, the paths you find on this directory. So in this case, we found A that is basically this, file one and file two. So these are all the files you can find inside this directory and b is not here because uh, b is basically a directory and there is there is no parent so there is some uh, explanation of why it's not being uh, popped out into the output but for now the idea is that you can you know you can iterate through the directory so if you're reading png files this is something you can do you can iterate through the data image directory and then get all the png files for example then there's also utilities for file names this example again i recommend you to to try it at home but basically so using the the path object from the file system library you can for example ask for the file name of this particular file no matter where it is file the name is bar txt so for example for homework number three that is the one from the image browser this is something you can do because you will have the image on the data and then um you only want the um, the the file name so there is a question that is isn't this in experimental file system the answer is yes and no actually it's a really good question so the problem is that if you need to do this it's because you didn't inside the llvm toolchain properly so the file system library is quite new so it has been here since c plus plus 17 and for example, if you're using uh, the default compilers that comes with Ubuntu 18.04, then it's not on file system, it's on experimental file system. Because four years ago, this library was on the experimental section, but now it's already stable. So actually, this is a good, uh, really good point to, to know if you have a, if your setup is working properly. So if you cannot compile this example, then this means that the setup is kind of wrong and I can help you so you can, we can discuss it offline on Discord. But actually when, when I did the example, the first tutorial, when we did like how to set up the, the dev box, so just running a hello world is not really smart. 
because any C++ compiler can compile Hello World. So it, maybe for future editions, I need to compile a file system Hello World, and this way you make sure that you have the compiling style installed and it's a modern one. I, I will help you offline. It's very likely that there is a really small error, but this is, I mean, if you're struggling with file system, then it's a matter of how you install it, the, the toolchain. More examples here on file names and also an extension. So maybe you want to know, for example, you want to eat, use the directory iterator through a directory, and then you have PNG files, TXT file, and whatever files. And then in, with this, you can actually ask for the extension for all these files. And if, for example, the extension is equal to PNG, let's do something. So this is really cool uh, utility libraries that you can use uh, to work with files on C++. More examples in here. Also, you can take the stem out of the of the file. So if you so if this is the path to your your files, then the file name will be bar txt, and then the stem will be bar. So if you ask for the stem, then you will get bar. So this is really really useful while working uh, with file system. And also you can do exist. So let's pretend that you want to. Uh, see if any files exist. So there is another demo here, but basically you can ask. So there is a small utility function, and then you you do file system exists, and then you ask for the path, and then if it's true, then you will print exists, and then if not, you will print doesn't exist. In this case, we are trying to see if this exists, if this other one exists, and here is the output. So it's really simple. The idea of this example is that if it Examples are on the slides, then you will probably read it and then you should try it at home. Uh, all these utility libraries are meant to make your life easier. So good luck with doing this with plain C or just doing everything by hand. And also if you read like the file system API, like this file system exists, it's really English, right? Uh, if you don't know the file system library and then you, you, you see this syntax like file system exists, then you can guess that you are asking if a particular path in the file system exists, then it's really easy to use. Okay, sorry for the delay. So we reach one of the most important moments on C++. So I will say that if you have any question, you can ask it now. It's probably going to be a good moment for asking question. I'm sorry I had to rush to connectivity issues. Anyway, so who are we? We are C++ programmer and we always want more types. So this is going to be a really high level introduction on classes and the type system of C++. So basically this is not going to make it into homework number five. So don't be scared. Uh, but the idea is that you get you start getting the sense and the intuition behind why we want to use types uh, like not the built-in types but the ones we write and also uh, just uh, like the bad news is that this course is not about object-oriented programming so usually so if you really want to learn this particular um, topic you will need a full semester on just object-oriented programming and then we will use uh, some of the techniques because that's uh, part of the core C++ ideas. But then the bad news is that I won't be able to explain you all the concepts on object-oriented programming. So it's really, really good if you know something from Java or Python because we are not going to dive deep into the concepts, but how to use these concepts with this language. So C++ and classes are basically a big thing. So when C++ came into the game 40 years ago, by that time was C with classes, but now it's a much different language. It's much more robust and general. So types are indeed important. So there is one example here that I, I actually took this example for Pian, the creator of the language. That is this little guy that is called the Mars Climate Orbiter. And actually, so by 1999, 
And believe me, there is plenty of these cases on the history of science. So the NASA sent this guy to the orbit to Mars. And then when, when, he, when, he, it, when he was about to reach its orbit, something happened and we ne never saw this guy again. So the little poor Mars orbiter were, was lost in space. And there are two drawbacks of this. One is that we are throwing chunk in the space, and this is really a bad idea. And the other drawback is that a lot of really bad stuff happened on NASA. So a lot of promotion didn't happen. Some PhD students didn't get the PhD just because they lost billions of dollars with this robot. So these orbiter were about to reach the orbit. And what happened by that time is that two functions or two interface were interaction to each other and one sent a double to the other one so a double is just a built-in type right so it's eight bytes it can be any floating point value with no extra meaning but the problem of these two interfaces is that one was expect expecting to work with uh, the metric system and the other one with the imperial system so when one sent the variable to the other one it scale this value but exactly 4.65 so why did this happen? Because there were no types in there. So it was basically a double. Double can be any kind of, um, can have any unit, right? So there were no meaning on the types and that's why we lost this poor guy. So types are indeed important. And this is the motivation behind the type safety system of C++. So this is a bad example. For example, let's say we want to blink LED and then we have this function. That is called blink LED, and then I put it bad, so you know this is the bad example, the bad guy. And then we say time to blink. And then my question is like, okay, what are the units of time to blink? It's just an integer value, it can be a hundred, a thousand. So if it's in milliseconds, maybe I want ten hundred milliseconds, but if it is in seconds, I need to do zero point one. So it's really hard to tell what is the unit of this uh, value. When I would detect the error. So this is really important. This is the type of question as a C++ programmer you need to start asking yourself. It's like when I will face the error. So is this something that I will deal with at compile time or at runtime? Because if it is at compile time, then it's probably good because I can fix it before I ship the, uh, the little guy to, to Mars. But if it's at runtime, then I am not sure when I will face this, er this error because it's something that will happen at runtime. So all the type safety ideas of C++ are meant to happen at compile time. And that's why it's also a really safe language. What is a good counterpart of this example? Then write the same function, but instead of using integer, use milliseconds. Milliseconds can be anything. So on the utility libraries, there is this type already defined. But let's pretend that it's not there then you can define this type by your own and then first when you read the function you see that you need to pass milliseconds and second you have two options so in this case if you don't specify the units then you will have an error and this will be a compile time error so you you won't be able to ship the robot to mars unless you solve this compilation error and this is really good news for you and then if you use, for example, seconds, that is not milliseconds, as specified on the syntax, the type safety system of C++ will abort compilation and also will give you an error at compile time. Again, this is really, really good and makes C++ a really uh, type safety language. And all these kind of errors uh, can be detected at compile time. So this is before shipping any program into the real world. So this is what we really want to do with types. And let's pretend there is another example. Go and check it out. If you want more flexibility, you can also use write this same function, but use multiple types like seconds and milliseconds. And also when you use the interface, so when you call this function here, it's clear that you want to do two seconds and then 150 milliseconds. Again, if you don't specify the type, then you will get an error. Compile time, you're safe. Like type safety in our field, like just an example. So ROS1, so actually people from ROS is doing a lot of work 
to migrate from ROS1. So when ROS1 started to be a, a code base for robotics, uh, this was, I guess, before C++11. There was not much expertise on, on the language itself uh, within the people. And also, I mean, probably the tools were not there. So ROS1 has a lot of uh, drawbacks, uh, not only with type safety, but this is one example. So if you go to the Hello World example from ROS, you will, from ROS1, you will see actually the link is here on, on the description. So go and check it out. You will see this toggle um, node that will just print to the standard output. And then at some point you will see this uh, statement that basically says loop rate and then 10. And then the question is like 10 watts, 10 hertz, 10 milliseconds. What is this loop rate? Uh, from people who know ROS1, you know that this unit is in hertz, but what happens if you don't know this? If you put 100, it will also work. If you put 1000, it will also work. So there's no guarantee on the units and on the type of this particular value. It's just a number, an integer number with nothing, with no real abstract information built on top of it. As a good example, now ROS is moving to a better uh, C++ usage. And for example, the same uh, Hello World example, now it's using milliseconds. So you will create a wall timer. So the syntax is a bit different because the, the ROS changed itself. But now instead of doing uh, 10, they are using 100 milliseconds. So you know it's 10 hertz, and the period of the timer is going to be 100 milliseconds. For sure, you know this, it's at compile time, it's guaranteed to be this, no problem, you can be safe, you can sleep this night knowing that your timer will be working at 100 milliseconds of, of period. So this is really, really good usage of the language. So it's the same functionality as the previous example, but much better code, be better re readability, and safer. And it's also guaranteed to run every 10, uh, 100 milliseconds. Right? So this is one of the many motivations behind classes and the type system. So just to uh, confuse you a bit more, I will be using the, name, the word class and the word type indistinctly. So whenever I say type, I can, I can be talking about the class, or whenever I say class, I can also be talking about types. So classes and types are exactly the same in C++. And I like much better the idea of types, because when you do classes, people automatically think in object-oriented programming, and actually you can create types that are not meant to use for with object-oriented programming. So the idea of types is much uh, broad, and it's better for me to to think it as the language to create new types instead of classes. So if you go to the book, you will see that C++ classes are just tools for creating new types that can be used conveniently as the built-in types. In addition, the arrived classes and the plates allow the programmer to express, and this is really important idea, relationships among classes and to take advantage of such relationships. Ideally, the program that expresses this relationship relationships closer to the real world will be easier to read and easier to maintain. A type or a class is a concrete representation of a concept, an idea, a notion, whatever. For, for example, a class can be a banana, can be a fruit, can be an image, can be a point cloud, can be whatever. A program that provides types that closely match the concept of the application tends to be easier to understand, easier to reason, and easier to modify. So that's one of the key concepts of C++. So creating new types will allow you to write better programs, maintain this better, and make it run faster. So if you have an image type, you can use this type on your program, and then when I read your program, I will know that you're working with images. If you, instead of using image types, you use just an array, like when this is how you do it in C, so you have an array, then if I see an array of integer values, I don't know if this is an image, an array of whatever. So it's much better to use types than just plain uh, types. A class is a user-defined type. So floating point values are not user-defined types. Image, for example, is a user-defined type. This will consist of a set of members. The most common kinds are data members and member functions. So all the syntax on classes will be taught in next lesson. So 
as a reminder, I want to give you like a, a quick overview of the main ideas behind uh, the concepts. And then the member functions can define the meaning of the initialization. This means whenever you create an object of this class and copy moving this object and clean up, that this basically means destruction. And then the member can be accessed using dot, but this is basically the syntax. Also, something really cool is that operators such as plus operator can be defined for a class. So let's say, for example, you have a point cloud. So a point cloud basically consists of a set of X and Y set points, right? And then you have another point cloud. And then you want to merge these point clouds together. Then one thing you can do is to define a point cloud class. This means a point cloud type. And then define the operator for this particular type. And then when you do, for example, point cloud 3 equals to point cloud 1 plus point cloud 2, then you will get the merge operation. And the meaning of this will be provided by you, the programmer. So it's not magically happen. You will, for example, do OK. Merging these two point clouds, just doing the plus operator, means to append all the points from one, one of the list to the other one. I don't know. So this is actually depends up to you, and it's up to the designer. But this will give you really good usage of the language, because if you, if you see like this plus operator, it's much easier to understand Rather that if you call a function saying a uh, function that uh, merge point clouds and then you pass the two parameters and then this will return you a third point cloud. This is basically much better to express with plus operator and then we will see this exactly on next lecture. A class is a namespace. So as usual, whenever you create new entities on C++, you will create a new namespace. So it has all the same information and meaning that a function namespace or uh, an empty namespace. The public members provide the class interface to the outside world in the program and the private members provide implementation details that shouldn't be shared with other parts of the program. And a struct is a class where all members are public. Much more details on the next lecture, so don't really worry about this. So as a, because we're doing computer vision, the, the most trivial example will be image. So this is how you will define an image class. Much of the implementation of this class is not there because it doesn't fit on the slide, but basically you will create an image class and then you will have the public members and the private members. So in this case, we will have rows and columns, and then we are initializing this with zero and this is what is new in C++ 11. And also with this, we are providing a way of create images that is not implemented here. So this is the same as uh, defining a function and then you need to implement the function. And let's pretend that there is a draw function that will draw this image on the screen. So basically, there will be an implementation that might be on image.cpp. We will see how to do this on next class. But basically, this is how you create an image. So you create a new image, the name it's the, the same as naming any other variable. And then the type if it's going to be image. And then if you inspect the constructor, you need to provide the file name. So you say, okay, my file is in some image.pngm. And then I want to draw this function, this uh, image to, <coughs> to the screen. Okay, so some examples on types or classes in our field. So for example, will be something like this. So these examples are taken from the Open3D library. Again, it's a really good library to see how to work with C++, uh, with real good C++. So we have the image library that we will see this really soon, but it's basically a type of geometry on 2D. Then they also define 3D entities. So this is wrong. So this shouldn't be here. But for example, you have a, a mesh base that's going to be a 3D entity. You have a point cloud that is also going to be a 3D entity. And then you have also voxel grid that we saw an example on previous lecture that is going to be a 3D entity. So this is basically some examples on classes. So you also know that people in our field does use this and it's really important. And as to finish the lecture, so as a small example, uh, this is the abstraction mechanism you, you should drive your mind when you think in classes. So we have the real world entity that is going to be an image. In this case, it's going to be an image for that has uh, 512 columns and 512 uh, rows. 
The idea is you want to create an abstraction that represents closely with the real world entity uh, this image. And then basically, one thing you can think, so this is pseudo code, so this is not real. You want to define the number of rows, this is going to be integer, uh, the number of columns, and then uh, the number of channels. So if this, is, if this is an RGB image, then this will be three. And then you will have the data that is basically all the data in the image that is going to be, you can put it as a vector of bytes. So each pixel will store one byte for the three channels. So you will have all this information in one vector. So this is really common to do with images. And then you will like to use this abstraction in a way your program uh, shows the intention of what you want to do with the image. So for example, you want to create a Linux picture object that is uh, an instance of this type image. And then you want to do, okay, go and search the Linux PNG file. And then for example, I want to draw to screen and for example, to visualize the image. And also for example, with this picture, I want to convert it from grayscale. So let's say you have an RGB image and then you want to compress everything into one channel and convert it to grayscale. So this is all the, so this is a wish. So you have an image and then you want programs to model these real world entities with abstractions and then you want to use it this way. So let's see if we can more or less do this. So this is one possible realization of the image class. Again, taken from Open 3D. So in this case, you will have a width and a height that is basically the rows and the columns. You will also have the number of channels and a vector with this type, this is basically one byte, so this is eight bits, and this is going to be the buffer with all the image information. So this is how these people saw, and it's actually it's really common to do it like this. So these are all the private members of your class, of your new type called image. And this is the implementation, actually this is the, not the implementation, the definition of some functions that you might want to use uh, with this particular new type. So one, for example, could be clear. So you want to completely clear everything that is on this image. Uh, you also want to, might want to do is empty. So you have an image type and then you want to, you wonder if this image is empty. And then this is going to give you an abstraction. So it's really, if you do Linux peak dot is empty, and this gives you a Boolean variable, then you can really ask if this is empty, and then you can express the intention of the program really easily. Then for example, you want to flip horizontal, do a, a horizontal flip on the image, and then return this new image. And then for example, you, want, you, want, you might want to filter this image out. And also this is another member function you might want to use. And lastly, for example, you want to allocate uh, memory. So you don't, we saw that it's really good idea to, to reserve memory on, on vector buffers. So whenever you create a new image, maybe you want to allocate uh, memory. So the idea is, did we achieve this goal? So we have a real world entity, and then we want to convert this real world, represent this entity with an abstraction. And then this is basically what we have. After defining all these steps on the image class, then this is how we would use it. And let's see if more or less like we reach the goal. So I'm creating an image. So this is real code actually, so you can build it and it will work. Uh, an image type, uh, this is the name of the variable. And then I will create it from this particular PNG file. Then for example, I want to create a new image that basically this auto replace the image type. And then I want the same Linux picture, but flipped. So I can call this function and I, I will get the, the flipped image. And then for example, I want to filter this Linux uh, image. Uh, and then I will call this filter. And then for example, I will use this type of filter that is also defined on, on the image class. And then I will get the filtered image. So if you try to read this uh, program, it express really well the intention of uh, what you want to do. So it's basically plain English. So you're really, uh, so this is really a really good model of the real world entities using abstraction mechanisms. For example, if the filtered Linux is empty, so let's say that there was an error while filtering, I want to print an error and couldn't filter image. So it's really, really plain English, right? So basically the idea is to represent this entity with an abstraction. And that's basically it for now. So that's the, the
quick overview of uh, of classes right we will see much more starting from next week on but i want to start like uh, injecting you ideas on your uh, little minds must watch for this week so before you get to do the homework you need to watch this introduction so it's a five minutes interaction of bug of visual words so you have no excuses for not watching it it's only five minutes and the homework number five will be out soon uh, you still need to uh, submit homework number three and number four so make sure you you catch up with the homeworks and also there will be an OpenCV tutorial that because you also need to use OpenCV for this homework so a lot of things happening uh, with this homework so the lecture wasn't heavy on, on concepts but you will have to do a lot for your homeworks and actually the homework is really easy so the solution can be providing again 20 lines of code and then you have the full solution but you need to know everything on the like all the concepts involved as a, as a recommendation you can do this uh, feature descriptor video so Cyril has a lot of videos on Sift and, and visual feature descriptor so this is one of them if it happens that you have no idea what a Sift descriptor is then you probably want to watch this video before getting to, to do the homeworks but I guess that most of you already are familiar with the idea or at least know where to find information the references and it's also an outline for this uh, Lecture is the utility library, the error handling that we skip because of times uh, constraint, and also the input output library plus the file system library, and lastly classes. So classes is going to be the topic that we will discuss through the rest of the four lectures we we have, and it's really important that you get to know how to model all these ideas. That's basically it from my side. If you have any question. Uh, you can write in the chat or you, we can discuss it offline uh, through Discord.